just waiting for it to start. OK, well, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to uh, this, the what will be, in actual fact, the inaugural event of the newly re-established International Institute for the Study of Cuba at Buckingham University or the University of Buckingham. So I'm really, really delighted to um, have Al with me today, with us today, who is Professor of Economics uh, Emer Emeritus now from the University of Utah. And Al and I have worked together for many years um, as editors of the International Journal of Cuban Studies. I've put links to both the Institute's website and the Journal's website um, on the chat for you to look at if you wish, if you're not familiar with them. Uh, we are the only uh, journal that is regularly published on Cuban studies in the world, and we're in our 13th volume. And um, Al is one of our regular contributors and also an editor. So it's a great pleasure to have Al with us. Before I ask him to speak, um, I'll just say that this is part of the Humanities Research, Research Institute uh, series of seminars at the uh, University of Buckingham, uh, organised by the director of the Institute, uh, Professor John Adamson. Uh, and without him, all the administrators, Adam Bowman and Natalie Winnett, this event would not have been possible. So I have to give my thanks and make sure that's posted before we start. So uh, this evening, um, uh, Al is going to talk to us uh, about the Cuban economic model. Um, and I'm sure you'll find this uh, extremely informative and interesting. Um, please, like I say, if you have questions to ask and they occur to you during the talk, you can use the chat function um, to to the right of the screen. If you don't know where it is, if there's a speech bubble at the top of the screen, if you click on that, it will open up the chat on the right hand side uh, and you can add um, your comments or questions there and we'll come back to them in the Q&A at the end. The format is simply that Al will talk for between half an hour and 40 minutes. He has a slideshow uh, and afterwards we'll take Q&As. OK, Al, so it's over to you. Thanks very much. Thanks a lot, Steve. Um, just on how I'll proceed, I think I'll probably more or less read for about 10 to 15 minutes and then I will stop doing that uh, just to get through some uh, preliminary material uh, first. First, I want to just establish a frame for how I go about uh, studying Cuba, uh, since that's a quite controversial issue uh, in the United States where uh, I was born and grew up and taught until I left. So where I was born, lived and worked until I retired 10 years ago, the United States, the topic of Cuba is extremely controversial. People were shot and blown up, not very many, but enough to send a message for supporting Cuban government, or even for calling for dialogue with it. Today, it is a much safer thing to do there, though still opposed by powerful interests. Given the nature of the US society and the US government, one would expect that uh, in the government, in the public press, but unfortunately, it's also largely, though certainly not exclusively the case in academia in the US concerning Cuba. Because of this, I want to preface my talk in this research uh, seminars in the humanities series by presenting the frame in which I have studied and written about the Cuban economy over the last 35 years to try to be as clear as possible how I, I consider that I'm doing academic work on Cuba. Uh, it is the frame of the subfield of economics, comparative economic systems. Very simply put, for some systems being analyzed, uh, it first tries to look at the basic issues in economics, how a society chooses what to produce, how it produces it, and how it distributes what it produces. It attempts to do this first step as scientifically objectively as possible. Note this first step does include establishing what the goals of a system are, uh, not evaluating the goals, but establishing what they are since these are one important input to determining what the system decides to produce. All this is supposed to be done not only independently of whether one thinks the goals in the system are good or bad, but also independently of if they think they are better or worse than some other system existing in some other similar country 
and which could exist in the country that's being studied. The second part of comparative economic systems research is then to compare the two systems once it's been established what they are and what they do. While in theory, that could be done objectively by simply saying this system achieves this goal better, that system achieves that goal better. In practice, almost always the step of comparison involves a significant amount of subjectivity, which most of the time is not acknowledged. For example, the most common simple single index used both academically and in the general press to compare two countries' economic performance uh, as to which is better is which one has the faster GDP growth. But that's a value judgment. Maybe you share it, maybe you don't, but it's a value judgment. That, for example, that that's more important than an evaluation of a country's economic performance than, say, equality or a resulting lifespan or whatever. So we're going to return to this very briefly in the talk when we talk about comparing the rate of growth of Cuba to the United Nations Human Development Index, for example. OK, so that's the frame. And uh, this talk on the Cuban economic, economic model will only attempt to address the necessary first step of the comparative economic systems process, the objective one. What is Cuba producing? How is it producing it? And how is it distributed? And above all, how is what Cuba is trying to do today changed from what it used to do? This, of course, is the main topic of public discussions about the Cuban economy around the world today, both by supporters of Cuban's economic goals and by those who would like to see it replaced, like to see the Cuban economic system replaced with a more standard third world economic model. OK, that for the preface on how my academic work on Cuba is intended to be executed. So now to the talk. Over the course of the 1950s, an ever increasing part of the Cuban people decided they did not like the economic and political model that they had then, a very standard model of third world capitalism. Social control lay in the hands of a very small and very rich part of the population, and these in turn were completely controlled by the economic interests and the corresponding politicians from a foreign power, the United States. On January 1st, 1959, a socially broad-backed revolution overthrew the existing U.S. client state. The immediate question for the new government questions were, what sort of new political and social order to build to replace the old one, and how would they build it? So this 45-minute talk will be on Cuba's economic model today. Of course, to understand why anything in the world is the way that it is today, one needs to know something about its recent past, and even aspects of its more distant past can be important with the importance to today diminishing as one goes further back in time. The economic model that is still being developed in Cuba today began to be developed after 1990 as a significant change from what Cuba's model was before that. So this talk will have three parts. We'll quickly talk about how the Cuban economy was doing and what it was like before 1990. Then we'll look at how the new model has done uh, and its process of change over its 30 year lifetime. Uh, and finally, say a little on how it's doing, uh, how it's changing today. So going to the first one, uh, the Cuban economy 59 uh, to 90, a quantitative uh, the consideration. Well, even before that, the first 30 years of the Cuban Revolution were actually a fascinating time for any academic studying comparative economic systems, as Cuba really had at least six different models for its economy during this first period. First, from 59 to 61, an attempt to continue capitalism, but to both be independent of the U.S. and to radically improve the lives of its poor farmers and workers. Second, from 61 to 66, the first attempts to begin to build a socialist economy, and particularly the well-known debates in Cuba concerning different ideas in Cuba about how to do that. Third, from 66 to 70, the development of a distinctly Cuban model for building socialism that the Cubans later came to regard as ultra-left in the sense of unrealistic, in many of its operational aspects. 
Fourth from 70 to 75, the beginning of the close collaboration with the USSR in preparation for implementing a modified form of the USSR's model of economic, uh, of the economy, which required sweeping changes in what existed, and especially preparation for integration into the USSR-led international economic system, the Council for Mutual Economic Assistance, Comic-Con. Fifth and 76 to 85, a process of unfolding of the modified USSR model. And uh, sixth, the, from 76 to 90, a reaction against the USSR model as in inappropriate in some aspects for building socialism, uh, a process called the rectification process. So different people date and name the various periods somewhat differently, but all agree on the point I want to make here that Cuba was continuously changing and experimenting with its economy during this time, and not just the continuous adjustments that all economies make, but rather having discussions and debates about the fundamental nature of a socialist economy and possible different ways to try to build one. This is an important sense in this frame, the current model that's been developing and unfolding for 30 years can be understood as one more attempt to determine the best way to build a socialist economy in the world as it exists today. But here I will talk on just uh, four things about this early period, the stuff that's on the slide right now. First, Cuba's uh, qualitative performance. Second, a look at their performance uh, qualitatively, that was quantitative and qualitative. Third, an issue for all small economies that was fundamental to the economic model that it developed then, and we will see is also fundamental to what it has done since 1990. And finally, a word on how what were always called Soviet subsidies, uh, which are always talked about for this, you know, when people talk about this period and the US blockade, affected not just Cuba's quantitative performance, uh, which they usually talked about in reference to, but were qualitatively central to the situation Cuba found itself in in 1990, and from that determined central aspects of the post-1990 model that this talk is about. Okay, so starting to talk about the that period, the quantitative aspects. As indicated in my opening remarks, GDP growth is the most common quantitative measure for making economic comparisons between countries. This talk will repeatedly indicate problems with this, but to get through this background section quickly, we're going to just first look at that as a quantitative measure of performance. So Cuba's record concerning the growth of its GDP prior to 1990 is sharply debated. At that time, Cuba kept its national economic statistics in the old Sto Soviet accounting system called the Material Production System, the MPS, whose conversion into the standard system of national accounts, the SNA, was always an academically and politically contested issue. I consider Zimbalist and Brudenius's uh, work, it's referenced there, um, and the page number on which they have a table that gives this result, uh, to be the conceptually the best and most carefully executed conversion. Note that the Cubans themselves did a number of conversions of that data from their earlier period after 1990 when they switched over to the SNA, both academic and government uh, bodies in Cuba. The results were generally consistent with what was reported in Zimbalist and Brudenius, uh, but for most of these estimates by the Cubans, however, the details of the conversion process are not published uh, with the results, whereas Zimbalis and Brudenius, Brudenius uh, uh, their conversion process is reported in extreme detail. So in any case, uh, Zimbalis and Brudenius found that from the year after the beginning of the revolution, 1960, until the most recent data available to them when they conducted their study, which was 1985, in Latin America, only Brazil's average yearly GDP growth of 3.4% exceeded Cuba's 3.1%. And the average Latin America growth rate, excluding Cuba, was only 1.8%. Now, given all the uncertainty, I would not make the claim that Cuba was one of the two or three best performing economies in Latin America at that time. It could very well be true, but there's legitimate grounds for real scientific debate on if it is true or not. But the data do indicate that it is safe to say that the claim by political opponents of the Cuban government, including economists, 
who claim that the, economist, the economy was a disaster in Cuba after it left the capitalist development path is just a false claim. And that one can comfortably say they did better than average for their region for those 25 years in the old type of system. Let's talk a little bit about some qualitative considerations. So a very quick and dirty uh, uh, procedure for making some qualitative considerations about an economy, not just for Cuba. Uh, the United Nations Human Development Index was only introduced in 1990. And so that's the very end of this period uh, that we're talking about. Uh, but we can ac actually assume that Cuba had a very, would have had a very good HDI uh, even before that. So the idea is, and this gets back to what I was just talking about, comparing, using just gross domestic product growth as a measure of how well an economy is doing. And in 1990, the United Nations decided that that was inappropriate. That's just one aspect of well, economic well-being. And they introduced the Human Development Index, which tried to look at uh, two other uh, measures that they, they did consider uh, GDP um, as a measure of wealth, because wealth can contribute to well-being, but they considered health care uh, as a general measure of uh, physical well-being, and they uh, included adult education as a measure of how much one's humanity is developed in a certain sense, how much one can participate as a citizen in society. And so... Because of this, a very simple way to compare, uh, to see a qualitative nature of an economy is to look at if the human development index is much higher than the, uh, the ranking. If you rank all the countries in the world, if the human development index is much higher than the ranking by just GDP growth. Uh, because that means that the country has chosen to take what resources it has and distribute them for human well-being. So if we uh, compared the rankings of the Human Development Index to the GDP in 1990, um, it was, uh, Cuba was 39 out of 130, and as late as 213 after this other period that we'll be looking at, it was 44 out of 187. Uh, the GDP in 219 by the World Bank was 76 out of 179. So we see that, uh, both under the old system uh, and under the system we'll be talking about from 1990 up to the present, Cuba has consistently had a higher ranking in the Human Development Index than the GDP, indicating something about the quality of its, of its uh, economy. The second thing I'm going to do, again, in, in this much time, I can't, you know, go into a lot of details and I give too many numbers, people will fall over with boredom anyway. But um, another way, this is, this is qualitative as well as quantitative. Instead of just looking at how wealthy the country is, the second point here is a list of eight things, which are economic development aspects, um, and, but they're qualitative, though they can also be measured quantitatively. So we can look at, you know, when we talk about people, we always talk about food and shelter as being the first basic necessities. So if we look at food, housing, health care, education, growth of self social wealth, and that's GDP, and I've only listed it as fifth because I consider it important, but not as important as the other things, poverty and unemployment, social participation in governments. And those are things which, if you want to, there's a, a paper there which I referenced that I wrote in 2016. It came out in Socialism and Democracy. And at the end of the slideshow, as we have the questions, I'll put up three papers of mine that I will reference, which do have lots and lots of hard numbers that are intended, at least, to support the, the points that I, I claim are true. So uh, the argument is there that Similar to the number that we saw that Cuba did very well relative to Latin America in all those uh, areas, uh, I would argue that Cuba did well uh, relative to Latin America 
in that pre-1990 period in all these other areas as well. And the, the areas are different. Cuba is known for very high results in healthcare and education. It's usually thought of as not so good in food, but if you actually look at the calorie uh, counts, they actually did better than most of Latin America. Housing is generally considered to be crumbling, but that's Havana, not necessarily the other stuff. So in any case, all the details are in the paper. The general picture I just want to point out is there's just no way that when you look at the numbers uh, all across all aspects of the economy, you can say that it was a disaster economically under the old system before. OK, so. I want to say something about the uh, small economies uh, issue. And this is important to, to Cuba back then and to Cuba now. It, it's very important to it now. In order to produce at an efficient scale for many goods, not all goods, many domestic goods, it isn't true, uh, agriculture, there's debate about, but for many things, you need to produce on a scale that's large. And that means that you have to produce on some scale bigger than the population of Cuba for 10 million people. And the way production is carried out in the world today is through production chains. And production chains have 10 or 15 or five or whatever steps in them. And you have to produce what's in your step. You have to buy the inputs. You have to sell the outputs. You have to get the inputs. You have to uh, uh, turn the outputs over to the next step in, 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 in the chain. And if you have a huge continental economy like uh, China or India or Russia uh, or the United States, these value chains can be entirely within the country, uh, many of them. Um, but if you have a small economy, that's just not an option. The idea that 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 Cuba could do anything in order for Cuba to produce efficiently, it has to trade. And that's exactly one of the reasons why back in the earlier period that we're talking about, when the United States, because it was totally integrated into the United States economy, when it was broken from the United States economy, it had to turn to the uh, Soviet economy given that the United States economy remained hostile to it and re remained hostile to it in her, um, uh, inserting itself into the world economy. So this is just a, a and this is going to explain a lot about what Cuba is doing today as far as its concerns with trade and making itself able to carry out trade in the new new things. But this is a fundamental and to give an idea on this, you know, we think of countries, highly developed countries. And so too small developed countries, uh, Belgium and uh, Netherlands down at the bottom there, the B and the N. Belgium, they, the, av the average of the exports and the imports, they, they usually talk about the openness factor and they add exports and imports together, but that's a rather stupid thing to do. It, what you're really interested in is sort of the average of how exports and imports compare to the total GDP. For Belgium, it's 82% the average of the exports and the imports, they average. Now, that doesn't mean that 82 percent of all their goods are exported and imported. I mean, that counts intermediate goods. So th but the point is that Belgium is able to carry out its have its high standard of living only because it's uh, integrated into a larger economy, the economy of Europe. And of course, the economy of Europe is uh, integrated into the world capitalist uh, economy. And Netherlands is 77%. For larger economies like Germany or, or France, the number is, you know, maybe only half of that because so many things, uh, so much domestic production is, in, is internal. But this is the point that any small country face. This is what Cuba or any of the third world small countries uh, have to face. And so that's the point that Cuba faced in the 1960s. And we're going to come back to that as to it's a it's one of the reasons that you've been doing much of the things that it's doing today. I want to say a word on Soviet subsidies uh, and the blockades, and then we'll get beyond this period. Um, the uh, the figures on massive Soviet subsidies are really rather ridiculous. Uh, the biggest product that they sold to the Soviet Union was sugar, and the way the CIA figures out how much the subsidies were is what the Soviets paid compared to what the sugar market is. The sugar market at that time really only covered about 10 percent 
of the total sugar produced in the world. And uh, almost all sugar was produced under contract. The United States made contracts, not just with Louisiana and Hawaii, but with the Philippines and every place that they, that they bought from. And as a rule, the contract prices were twice the world market price. And the world market price for sugar is basically a very small dumping market. When you produce more sugar than your contracts call for, you just dump it on that market, try to sell it to somebody, and you take whatever price you can get. And so the price is very, very low. In a few years, the the price goes very, very high because people didn't actually, you know, droughts and stuff, people didn't actually meet their quotas. They have to go to the market to buy sugar to fulfill their quotas. But on average, very roughly, you could say that it's about half uh, during those uh, decades, it was about half of, of what the uh, contract price was. Um, and so uh, uh, and so so the important point for Russia, for, for the USSR, was that they could buy sugar from Cuba cheaper than they could produce it from beet sugar uh, in the Ukraine. So it was a good deal. It was uh, a David Ricardo's uh, comparative advantage uh, sort of thing. Uh, they could not have gone to the world market and bought that much sugar because there wasn't enough there. And as soon as they started to buy it, there'd be a shortage on that market with its small amounts and the price would have actually gone above the contract price. So anyways, I just want to point out that that the numbers that the CIA and the, the general myth that there was these huge subsidies uh, just isn't true. What is true is the second point uh, is that there was tremendous Soviet support for Cuba's development as well as its growth. And that has to do with what I was talking about before. Uh, Comic-Con, uh, the Soviet Union, but the its international body integrated Cuba into these productive chains so that Cuba could actually produce uh, at effective levels. They also uh, both... Uh, invested but uh, gave loans for capital uh, for buying capital goods uh, so they actually helped to industrialize uh, 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 Cuba, break it out of the third typical third world pa uh, pattern of only producing um, farm goods and uh, agricultural goods and, and and minerals so and they they made loans they did financing they did all sorts of stuff to actually help the development but that's not the same thing as, as subsidies that was their choice to uh, help develop the country, uh, as supposedly some international bodies are supposed to do with the least developed countries in the world today. Uh, I'm not going to talk about the cost of the blockade as far as numbers, because I'll get to those at the end. Um, but uh, the obvious point is that uh, the blockade always cost Cuba uh, during all that uh, early period a tremendous amount of money. Um, even though they were trading extensively with the Soviet Union, they always wanted to do a certain amount of trade with uh, the Western world, partly because some capital goods were better, uh, just for a, very, uh, a various number of reasons. All those costs were elevated greatly, um, with possibilities of costing the Cuban economy up to 5% of its gross domestic product every year. Okay, so let's talk about the what I want to talk about, Cuba's economic model from 1990 to the present, a 30-year overview. Again, we're going to do quantitative considerations and then some qualitative considerations, basically what stayed roughly the same and, of course, what everybody's talking about, what changed significantly. So I'm going to just put four charts up here, and this is the quantitative consideration, a good way to look at how the Cuban economy did over the 30 years to the present would be to compare it to the other countries in its region, Latin America. And you can see here the yellow line is Cuba. The red dotted line is Latin America. You can see the disastrous fall after the break uh, with trade relations with the Soviet Union when the Cuban economy in three years fell by about 36, 37 percent, the same as our Great Depression in about the same amount of time. Um, and then by 94, it began to recover so that by the end of the year, it had a 2%, a 0.2% of growth. And then after that, after that, you can see that Cuba actually, as with the earlier period, I wouldn't make any claim that it was one of the absolute best economies in Latin America, but the, the claim that Cuba has been a disastrous economy just isn't true. 
uh, it outperformed average Latin America most of the time. The big peak you'll see in the middle is the commodity boom. You'll see that Latin America had that as well, but Cuba had it too, particularly, especially because of its uh, nickel. Okay, so that's the general quantitative thing. Uh, again, Cuba has done okay with this non-typical third world development model, which they've been developing. I want to say just a couple of words on why the model works the way it does in Cuba. And this ties back to this idea of being a small country and imports and exports. If you look at this chart right here, uh, the, the top line is the imported goods. This is not goods and services. This is just goods. This is, uh, uh, and the bottom line is the exported goods. And you'll see that they import a lot more goods than they, they export. Now, uh, I have here the figures, but I, I won't even uh, go into them. Importing of goods is not an option for a small country. As I just explained, in order to be able to produce, they need to have steps in the production process that they focus on, and therefore they have to buy the inputs and they have to sell the outputs. And so, for example, uh, in 2018, the total uh, uh, imports of about uh, 14 billion pesos, uh, about 80% of those were a combination, well, most of it was intermediate goods, exactly what I was talking about, just so their economy can run and produce and make things and then they had another 15% or so capital goods. And they had the total imports. People talk about them cutting their imports. The actual consumption imports were just about uh, 20%. But you can see the problem. So they need to import all these goods in order to run the economy. But they don't sell nearly enough goods uh, to pay for those imports. And that's, that's at the heart of their problem. So this then shows the solution that they've had over the period of the 30 years. Well, actually, this only goes back 15 years. Um, but uh, the, the balance on goods, what we looked at in the last picture, showing that they imported much more than they exported, you'll see that it's negative because they're importing more than their, the dotted line at the bottom. They're importing more than they're negative, than they're, they're selling. And of course, the only way they can get money to do that is they can sell something else, and that's services. And so you can see the top dotted line, and that's their export of services. And that, uh, that, that, uh, that boomed uh, starting in the, in, the, in, the, in the 1990s, starting under the new model, and it's, it's been the driving force. It's been what's allowed them to import the goods they need for the, for the economy to produce. Um, what 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 do they sell as uh, what do they sell as uh, services? Well, the the thing which everybody talks about is um, tourism, and I want to talk a little bit about that. The myth of Cuban overexpansion of tourism. Uh, in two thousand eighteen, tourism's total contribution to Cuba's GDP. Uh, Uh, <clears throat> not from this picture. In 2018, tourism's total contribution to Cuba's GDP was 10.56% of the GDP, okay? Which is also exactly the world, almost exactly the world average contribution of 10.36%. That's what tourism contributes to the world GDP. Now, this is a lot lower than most similar Caribbean island, uh, the most similar Caribbean island to Cuba, the Dominican Republic, which gets 17.24% of its GDP. Uh, and yet people don't go around talking about that being uh, excessively dependent on tourism. And its nearest island neighbor of Jamaica has an incredible 33.96% dependence uh, on GDP in 2018. But also two of the three Latin American somewhat diversified developed relatively big economies are higher or about the same, Mexico, get 17.23% of its GDP uh, from tourism, and Argentina just barely lower than Cuba at 10.5%. And there's three large developed Western European countries, 
that are more dependent on tourism than Cuba. Spain gets 14.7% of its GDP, Italy gets 13.8%, and you in the uh, your own UK is uh, just a little bit higher than Cuba at 10.96%. So in any case, the point is I just should get rid of the myth that, that that tourism is the only thing that makes uh, that makes uh, Cuba uh, go. It's very important, as we'll see, but it's not the only thing. Okay, so let's uh, let's look at the tourist industry over the whole period. That's what this slide is, uh, and what you, you can see that it, on the right there, it gets up to bringing in three billion dollars out of the twelve to fourteen uh, billion dollars of. Uh, uh, of goods and service exports, so it's running, you know, about 20 percent. Uh, so it's still very, very important. In the 1990s, you can see the rapid rise, and and so tourism was the real engine of the economy. They didn't have other things bringing in a lot of foreign exchange with which they could buy the goods they needed to make their economy work. But you can see after about the year 2000 the rapid rise begins to flatten off quite a bit. And that's because after 2000, two other uh, industries joined uh, Cuba as uh, the main uh, industries for earning uh, foreign exchange that they needed in order to buy goods to make their economy work. And that was nickel uh, and uh, the, 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 sell, the sale of medical services overseas. And th this last thing is actually kind of uh, interesting. Uh, Cuba earned 14.5 billion pesos from the exports of goods and services in 2018. You could have seen that on the last slide. Contrary to most third world countries, services dominated with 81.1% of the export earnings. That's already an interesting result about the Cuban economy. Well, goods or er, goods earned only 18.9 percent. Again, you saw that low that low performance of good exports before. We see that tourism generated about three billion pesos, just over a fifth. Now, for 200 for the year uh, 2018, they published for the first time before it was always shielded because of the U.S. aggression uh, against them. The knowledge based category human health and social care services. Uh, at 64, at 6.4 billion, it was twice tourism. So, uh, also much smaller, the non-traditional category of telecommunications and transmissions and provisions of services for information at 70, at 722 million pesos was just below the largest of Cuba's simple goods export, ores, which is primary nickel and scrap metals. Uh, it was well above the traditional export earners such as tobacco products at 260 million and sugar production, that was a, a low year, but at, at 180 million pesos. So anyways, the, the idea is again that, you know, the, the stereotypes we have of what Cuba exports and what makes the economy work are just uh, fundamentally off. And it, it tells a lot about the Cuban economy that the big earners are now uh, knowledge-based products, which is something for a third world country. <clears throat> Okay, so that's the quantitative aspect of that 30 year period. Here's the qualitative aspect, which will be very, uh, very, very brief with. Um, number one, what has stayed roughly the same? Well, again, I'm just gonna refer to that same article. Those, uh, you know, if you want lots of numbers, uh, more numbers than you really wanna see, um, you know, take a look at the article and you'll see the case for what they have done and what they haven't done. The article goes up to 215. So it covers both the period uh, before 1990, but also most of this period that we're talking about right now. So that was a continuation. They continued to be very, they continued to do well, uh, not spectacularly, but they continued to do, do well, certainly solidly by Latin American standards. And what also continued to be important is um, the goal. And the goal has been laid out very directly much more so than most other countries in a series of documents. Um, I'll just list them here. I mean, the one is from 2011, uh, it's what in English we call the guidelines. It's a thing with 300 
different specific things on what they're going to try to do to build their economy. But it also indicates very, very clearly the goal. And then in uh, 2016, 2017, they came out with three more documents updating that. And so we can say, you know, unlike most countries, there, there's, there's actually official documents that state very clearly what the goal of the Cuban economy is. And that's the one thing which has stayed the, the same. And the soundbite expression for it has become to develop a prosperous and sustainable socialism. Now, they're very open to saying that they're not sure exactly what that is. They're not sure what the socialism is that they're developing will look like once it's developed, but they are committed to developing it. So that's the other thing that stayed the same. OK, um, now I'll just get to what has changed and we'll, you know, we'll end the talk with this uh, because that's the thing which people talk about uh, most when they talk about the uh, people around the world when they talk about the Cuban economy, what's changing. So uh, in order, it, I mean, there's just lots of very specific things, but in order to organize it somewhat, in, in a paper, a second paper that I'll, I'll give a reference to again, so you can read all the numbers you could possibly want. Uh, in 1989, the Cuban economy, there's four aspects right here that changed significantly after 1989, each one of which had many, many aspects. But one is that they received external capital for productive investment and hence both growth and development beyond that available for domestic savings. That's what they received before 1999. They received it from the Soviet bloc. After 1999, they weren't going to receive a uh, lot of uh, investment from the uh, uh, Soviet bloc. And so that became their challenge, how to attract investment. Because for any third world country, they're not rich enough to have significant savings to develop uh, uh, money to put into uh, uh, investment on their own. If they're going to catch up with the world in any sense, they're going to need uh, investment uh, from the third world. And so much again, this is much of the discussion about over this 30 year period. But the discussion which is going on today is how do we attract uh, uh, more investment? Uh, and that's a big change from what it was before, because that all came from the Soviet Union. Second thing, which of course we all know, is that the system was extremely centralized. It was actually more centralized than the Soviet Union was, was centralized. Um, um, but, and so that's been changed. It's been a, a process of decentralization. And that shouldn't be confused with the process of privatization, which I'll talk about next. Decentralization means in the state sector itself, they're getting decisions out of Havana, they're getting them out of the ministries, they're getting them out to the, on the one hand, to the regions, and on the other hand, to the productive units. Uh, the regions and even the localities, they're having big discussions about local development. So that's a big change that's been going on for 30 years. And you'll see that with the discussions which are going on over this last year, those are still the same topics which are being discussed. The third point, uh, which has changed a lot, is that almost everything was state run and state owned. And what we know now is that there are many different forms of property, many different forms of production. We have the Cuenta Propistas, we have the people that are self-employed, we have the co-ops, uh, uh, and so forth and so on. Um, during this time period, for example, the, uh, in, 18, in 1989, in the agricultural sector, there's 80% of the, by employment, 80% of the people that worked were on state farms, 20% were on non-state farms. By 2014, you had about 94% on non-state farms. And that's especially because they have these, um, uh, pieces of land that they give to people uh, in, in usufructarios, in, in usufruct. Um, but in any case, the point is that in agriculture, there was an absolutely huge shift. And then the stuff that you hear about all, all the time, which is separate from agriculture, the self-employed in the city themselves, which officially is now going up to maybe 500,000 out of a workforce of roughly 5 million, roughly 10 percent. But that underreports stuff dramatically, so you've got at least 50% more than that. 
So there's been this huge change, uh, and then the co-ops, uh, which are coming along. Again, uh, this paper here gives numbers uh, on all these all these things. That's the uh, uh, and the last thing is that before everything was produced very much according to a combination of long and short term plans, and I'm not going to say much on that because it's a little hard to get. It's it's very hard to get hard data on what the nature of the planning process going on in Cuba is today. All the documents indicating what the goal is for the new economy indicate that it is to be a planned economy, and they intend to do planning by some way very different than the old Soviet way of quantitative planning. Exactly how that is, it's tough. What they are doing, what they intend to do, it's tough to get details on. But the two points are that this has changed. Uh, what has stayed the same is they intend to make it a planned economy. Um, what has changed dramatically is the way it's planned absolutely cannot be done according to the quantitative planning that was done before. Okay, last point, and it's uh, sort of the, uh, Steve, how am I doing on time? Oops, I can't hear you. You're doing, you're doing fine, Al. You've been speaking for about 40 minutes. So oh, great. You oh, just wrap cool. up. Now okay, I'm going gonna, gonna to wrap up. And that just shows how good my planning is. So that's very, very good. OK, so uh, this is the, I'm going to wrap up now. So Cuba's unfolding economic model today and tomorrow. And there's a constant flow of new proposals coming out of the government and new requests coming from different aspects of academia and think tanks and societies about what the government should do. Uh, it's just going on all the time. But there was, in the last year, there's been three particular flurries uh, of, uh, uh, of new proposals. And one was the 16th of July, 2020. And the Council of Ministers met and came up with the, the Estrategia Economica Social para el Impulso de la economía y el enfrentamiento de, ah, I'm sorry. So the, the, the economic social, well, you can read it too, but the economic <laughs> social strategy uh, to push forward the economy uh, and uh, confront the crisis, uh, uh, the world crisis, which is uh, provoked by COVID-19. So what, what, what do we do in reaction to this downturn in our economy? Uh, that was being suffered by uh, last summer uh, by uh, because of COVID-19. And so there was a whole series of proposals there. And then this January and February, they came out with a whole series of new proposals and new changes. And most well-known one was the uh, uh, monetary, un monetary unification. Okay, I have to turn off this thing. Um, okay, Phew, sorry about that. Uh, mon well, it tells me I will be done. Monetary unification, um, but there's actually other things which are just as big that people don't talk about. The large raise in salaries uh, to uh, to compensate for that, and and so forth and so on. And there's big questions on what that's going to do for inflation and everything. And the last thing, which there's really, I mean, it's just within the last few weeks, so there's certainly no ability to talk on either what will exactly come out of it or what the effects will be of what comes out of it, which takes another half year. That's the 8th Congress of the, of the uh, Communist Party of Cuba, which was April 16th of 1921. So those three things were a number of big things. I want to talk about so I'm just going to go over these quickly. This was a Cuban economist following that first meeting in, in, in July, uh, identified the following nine aspects as central to the strategy that's proposed. And what I really want to, and what I really want to do is um, sorry, I don't understand. And what I really want to do is just mostly point out that everything that is being discussed right now can be understood in terms of the frame that we've built in the in this in this talk. 
And you, you can see that what they're talking about is exactly the issues that we've been talking about. OK, so the nine things which she uh, put forward were the issue of centralized planning. Just what I said. They're committed to doing it. How will you do this? This is actually a fascinating issue because it ties into the world discussion on swinging away from neoliberalism back towards uh, industrial policies. Now, those are industrial policies to support capitalism, so this is a different thing. But the idea that planning is actually useful in any system, actually any human activity for that matter. Um, but so that's one aspect. Import substitution, uh, we, we talked about that. Now, remember, imports were mostly intermediate goods. Uh, they certainly can't import substitute capital goods. They can't produce very many of their own capital goods, some, but not many. But they could uh, they could probably produce some of their intermediate inputs and they could import they could certainly uh, 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 substitute some of their consumer goods. Um, but the consumer goods are only 20 percent. But of that 20 percent, I don't know, probably over half certainly is agricultural goods. And so that's a big area, which, I mean, Cuba should be able to grow a large part of its own food, and it doesn't. Um, third, regular, and that's much discussed in Cuba today. Uh, third, regulation of market mechanisms. Uh, oh, that's her comment on that. Forget her comment. But anyways, so that's the idea. They're introducing markets. They're going to, they openly said they intend to use markets. Uh, my personal opinion is that markets are not inconsistent with uh, uh, socialism, um, but that's more important to the point. That's the opinion of the people that are running Cuba. Um, and uh, one shouldn't confuse market socialism, uh, which I consider fundamentally a capitalist system, with having markets in socialism, which is what Cuba is doing. Um, so, but the question is, if you're going to have, if you're going to have markets, and you're going to have planning, then you have to figure out how to regulate the markets. OK, Com uh, complementary and multiple economic actors. That's what we talked about, the Quintipropistas, the Cooperativistas, and the state sector. OK, and then the last slide, uh, dy uh, dynam dynamizing uh, domestic demand. OK, this is, of course, something which China is into big time, but China's quite a bit bigger than uh, Cuba. Um, but nevertheless, uh, the idea is that uh, it's important to any economy, even an economy of only 11 million people, that uh, domestic demand uh, drives stuff, particularly as the standard of living goes up and particularly uh, as they suddenly gave tremendous salary uh, increases to a lot of people. OK, so now those things are out there uh, being ready to to buy stuff. And of course, the important thing is to figure out ways to produce stuff for those people to buy. Six, the uh, the autonomy of the state business sector. That's part of that decentralizing that I talked about, not just decentralizing by going to a private sector or self-employed or anything like that, but in the government sector itself, giving more autonomy to the productive units. Uh, their state-owned productive units, but not being run by uh, the ministries in Havana. Seven, implement key aspects uh, of the resizing of the non-state uh, sector. Okay, so um, that's, you know, that, that's, that, that's the general idea that they have decided, this is what they decided 30 years ago, this is what's written up in the, the, the documents from the last 10 years, that there were sections of the economy that they were not running at all well. Uh, and they were running them as state sectors. And if they can't run them well as state sectors, they shouldn't be run as state sectors. So they should be run either as self-employed or cooperatives or something. Uh, competitiveness. And this is, of course, really important, especially in the state sector, um, because they still intend the, the state sector to be uh, the most uh, at the heart of the economy. And, you know, going back to Adam Smith, opening sentences of Adam Smith, you know, the thing which determines a country's standard of living is uh, its uh, level of productivity. So, uh, and then the last thing is uh, they are very much aware of it and they are very active in it. They're putting significant resources into it, uh, active environmental policy as part of their overall economic policies. 
So with that, I will end. And I, as we go into questions, I'll just put up these three articles um, in which you can find more numbers than you want to look at to that I believe support the points that I made. Thank you. Thank you very much, Al. That's uh, tremendous. Uh, we've got some applause in the background. Uh, <laughs> that's that's great. And somebody's clapping on the screen, which is fantastic. Uh, OK, so well done uh, for getting so much packed into such a short frame. Um, so the floor is open for questions. If you'd identify yourself when you ask the question, that'd be great. Now, wait a second. I'm, am I going to be able to see the people asking the questions? The you'll, like have to, see. you'll have to now. You'll take take your, uh, you know, um, stop sharing your screen and you'll be able to see. OK, OK, so let me just see. Then your slide sharing. will disappear, but. Yeah, that's OK. People have enough time and then. And anyways, you have my email and you have it from Steve, so you can always write to me if you didn't get it. So let me end my slideshow. OK, I just ended it. Now I ended this. Wait a second. Don't say PowerPoint. Don't say that. I don't want to do that. OK. Are well, you yeah. still sharing your screen now? Yeah, oh, I'm still sharing my screen. Go uh, back to that. Oh, wait screen. a second. I go, I go back to this thing, Cuban. Top right. A top right now. Wait a second. I'm not, I'm not well, on. Well, maybe the three ellipses stop sharing. Maybe one of those. Uh, wait a second. Wait a second. I'm getting here. I've got your three, three ellipses. I, I've opened that. Meeting details, device settings. No, yeah. no, no, no. Next to leave at the top, Al. The Next screen. to leave. I'm sorry. Leave. Click Share there. content. Okay. That's it. Okay. Great. Now you're I, back in. I'm back in. Okay. I can see people. Okay. Okay. We've got a couple of comments in the in the chat very interesting talk thanks at first glance venezuela has a lot more going for it with major oil reserves so why did it implode while well, cuba continued under much more adverse conditions from the us okay um well okay now wait a second i am i'm actually not see i i see is there a, a view on this show participants maybe that's it yeah. Oh, I see, yeah, but I still don't no, see. Anything. You need to go to um, the three ellipses at the top, Al. Yeah, yeah. Drop down list. Click on yeah. gallery. Go down gallery. Okay, I did gallery, and nothing happened. I get a couple. I get well uh, over on the side here. I I don't get pictures. I get uh, I get a list of the people who are in the meeting. And I get two, two things, but I still have this bottom thing, which tells me desktop and window and stuff like that, and I can't turn that off. Hmm. Okay, I guess we can see you fine. You can see me fine. All right, I can't see you, so that's 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 appropriate. It's like sitting with a, a, a beaming spotlight when you're in a police uh, investigation. So that's that's good enough. Okay, so. Um, well, th there's debates uh, about Venezuela, why it went uh, worse. And, you know, I, I, I went down there a number of times during the aughts, during the, the first decade of the century. And, and so I looked at it actually pretty closely. And, but, you know, different people have different ideas. One, pe one argument, you know, it, it's hard to, I mean, we know it didn't, it, it, didn't work, and the, the answer is why. One argument is that they didn't break capitalism. So Chavez uh, decided not to do what was done in uh, uh, Cuba, which was nationalize the, uh, the bulk of the economy, and that gave them a long-standing permanent base. Um, they actually took the oil reserves and they actually made a huge shift uh, to make more of the oil reserves flow into the, uh, the government coffers. And they actually used that to improve the welfare of the people. And that's why they were very popular. And that's why they won, you know, 11 elections in a row. Second reason is that, you know, people claim that Chavez's adherence to trying to continue to win by standard bourgeois elections was something which hampered 
what he could do. He actually had to make alliances with, he had to put together a party, which wasn't very ideologically uniform or even committed to going very, very far. There was a bunch of opportunists in it. He had to depend upon them. He couldn't cross them very much. I mean, one of the classical examples is when, you know, one of his main supporters, who was a governor of one of the states, called out the troops of his state to attack workers trying to uh, not be locked out of a factory uh, owned by a Brazilian company. Now, and that, that got him in trouble in Chavez's party, but you had to go pretty far in order to get in, in trouble. So anyways, they, those are sort of the, it, it, it's hard to say. I, I will say that, um, and then I'll just stop on this. I think there was something in the Venezuelan revolution, which, you know, has been largely killed, um, uh, that was absolutely exciting. When I went down there, it was just beginning. They set up the system of communes and communal consuls. And I think that those things are extremely democratic forms. I mean, it's sort of like a generalization of participatory budgeting to a much higher level and everything. And I went and attended meetings and stuff like that. And the the participation from the people in, in, in controlling their own lives was really fascinating. Chavez had this idea that they would be an alternative form of government. I mean, they use the word dual power sometime, but that gets confused with dual powers that existed in the Russian Revolution, which was a different type of dual power. But he was never able, he was never willing to pull the plug. Chavez was never willing to pull the plug on the, uh, the old system. Uh, of governments. You had these two systems of government. Well, one was just beginning to grow and people were enthusiastic. The other one was existing for a long time with this uh, corruption and and stuff like that. And the, the two of them were always uh, fighting over stuff and, and everything. When Chavez was about to die, the last thing that he told to Maduro was, you know, I made an error in not pushing forward these communes and communal consuls. Um, and the life of this revolution depends upon it. And Maduro definitely did not push them forward uh, in any way. So, I mean, those are just comments. Um, it, 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 it's a much debated uh, issue. They had a lot more resources, um, but I mean, in a simple term, they probably had a less clear political vision of trying to build an alternative to capitalism, even if the vision in Cuba isn't very clear itself. Thanks, Alan. Uh, Claire, you've got your hand up. Claire Stanley. <clears throat> Please ask your question, Claire. Sorry, I didn't mean to do that. Just ignore that. Sorry, it's a mistake. <laughs> okay. uh, Alpha, Alpha Kane um, has put a comment in the chat. Thanks for a very informative talk. I didn't realise that tourism played a small part in Cuba's GDP. And I think that's a really interesting point, Al. Um, I wonder if you might expand a little bit on that. Um, yeah, I, I'd, 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 I'd always sort of thought that, yes, it, it is small if you take it as this quantitative measure of GDP. Yeah. But in actual fact, qualitatively, it's very, very important because it's an industry that actually gathers hard currency. In yes. other words, foreign currency, which in the context of the embargo stroke blockade, yeah is what Cuba is kind of starved of. So although it's 10%, it's a 10% that is very important. I wonder if you'd comment on that. Yeah, so that's that, that's exactly it. And, you know, I was trying to sort of say that as I talked out of, you know, both sides of my mouth very quickly, um, which is uh, that it's only 10% uh, of the GDP. But as we saw, it is 20% of the foreign currency earnings right. now uh and so that that's that's very important as we saw over the over the aughts uh it um it uh in the 1990s it was 
it was vastly more than 20% of the foreign currency earnings. I don't know what it was, but it was vastly more than that, uh, 60%. And, and I will go back and look that up uh, and incorporate it by taking those some of those pictures back. But um, but it could have been 60 percent. It was the driving force. It got the it was the engine of the, of the economy and everybody in Cuba knew it. And for exactly the reasons you said, it, it got the foreign currency and the foreign currency was necessary to buy inputs that run anything in the economy. So it was like life and death. Uh, but, you know, by the by the um, by the beginning of the aughts, um, it changed, and people's perception of that did not change so much. So it remains a tremendously important uh, 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 industry. And the fact that it's almost shut down right now is a huge kick in the teeth. But as we saw, it's only half of uh, it's only half of uh, of uh, and nick nickel's now quite a bit down. So nickel's not up with it anymore. So that makes it more important too, because nickel prices are down and production on the world scale is down. So nickel's nickel's down way down from it was up with tourism. Now it's maybe a quarter of tourism. But uh, the selling of of, of of medical services in, in 19, uh, uh, 2018 was double it. And that's just an interesting point. Once again, I, I didn't actually finally put the, the final statements on the size of the blockade. And I won't try to go into that right now. But um, the, the United States blockade is just so severe. And so this is the main earner right now is selling of foreign uh, of medical services. And what they've done, you know, by any sort of capitalist logic or anything, um, it, it, they've developed a product. Uh, they develop a product which they can sell overseas cheaper. It's a high quality product which they can sell overseas cheaper. And right now, the world is in phenomenal need of medical services. They should be able to explode with their selling of medical services right now in order to actually completely replace the loss in tourism. But they can't. And they can't because of the blockade. Because the U.S. government goes to every single country that has any doctors, it goes to Andorra, it goes to Italy, and tells them, you got to get rid of these doctors. And some of the countries say, screw you, we're going to save our people. And some of them say, okay, I mean, we have interest in the United States, so we have no choice. Um, it, it's, I mean, it's, yeah, so, so that, so, so, so so that's it on the on the tourism thing. Um, yeah, real important. Um, right now, it's just off the map. I mean, it's, you know, it's not even 10 percent of what it was. Uh, and uh, it's not going to come back right away. Um, but with its fall off, we should remember that it could actually be replaced to some extent right now by another product which Cuba has, which is only being blocked by non-capitalist economic mecha mechanisms, i.e., you know, political intervention. Right. Um, Roger Grimshaw has asked, you talked about production a lot. What has happened to distribution and in particular to inequality? So um, uh, distribution has gotten worse. Uh, if you measure it by Gini con uh, uh, coefficients, uh, it's gotten worse. Um, which is not to be surprised as you have more market mechanisms, even if the market mechanisms by and large uh, affected uh, self-employed people. Uh, so we're not talking about the markets where you hire large amounts of labor, uh, live off of other people's labor. But uh, nevertheless, uh, and and then there was very specific things. Th the biggest source of wealth, I mean, not quite. I mean, a few people get rich off of a few very specific things. But for a secondary level, it's actually renting out houses uh, and stuff like that, which is much more lucrative than most of the self-employed um, job. And so remittances and renting out houses are actually two things that have uh, contributed greatly to um Inequality. And so Cuba has been talking for a long time 
And in the present measures, which are just taken uh, in February, they've really done what they said they were going to, to try to do. And now we're going to see what the result is. And the result's going to be it's going to be a problem and, and it's maybe going to be inflation. But what they want to do is they want to return that people's income comes fundamentally from the work they contribute to society, that it doesn't come from owning property so you can rent it out. It doesn't come from having relatives overseas. They're happy to have remittances come in because those things actually do trickle down, uh, unlike uh, the United States economy. But um, uh, they, they don't do it equally, but they, they actually get dispersed. Um, <clears throat> so, and, and that's, of course, why they have dramatically raised uh, salaries so that people can purchase stuff. Unfortunately, if they cannot produce goods when they've raised salaries, that will cause serious inflation, uh, which they can always limit in the short term with price controls, but that just leads to a black market. And so they're taking a really big risk. And, and I'll say once again, the United States and its blockade is complicating it. You can make monetary transitions like this vastly easier if you have a big amount of money behind you to facilitate the transition process until the new process starts working and generating its own revenue and stuff like that. And that's why, you know, most countries that do any sort of change like this get money from the IMF or something like that. Of course, they have they have conditionalities imposed, but that's where they get it from. Cuba can't get any of that. It can't get any of that because the United States prevents any international bodies from putting up finance uh, for Cuba to do it. So Cuba's got having to do this without reserves for doing it, which makes it much more dangerous, much more likely that inflation can take off. Mm. Claire, your hand is still up. Are you still? No, um, I'd like to speak. Thank you. OK, you good. Um, I just wanted to ask a little bit more about the medical services. What does that actually consist of? I know they're sort of specialist in um, eye surgery particularly, but just a bit curious um, what sort of services are, are being sold, please. So um, it, 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 is a broad, it is a broad category, you know, a product category, but the biggest... What they had as their biggest earner back in 2018, uh, before some of the political shifts in Latin America, was they actually sent doctors. And so doctors went out and they served in areas where the doctors in the countries involved didn't want to go, uh, either because living conditions were too hard or else they didn't make enough money, one reason or another. So, uh, and, and they, they had a huge exchange program with Venezuela, uh, and but then they also had a large one with Brazil until Bolsonaro came in. Uh, and um, so that was actually the biggest thing. But they actually have beyond that, they have all sorts of stuff. Cuba, like a lot of countries, pays attention to linkages uh, in production. And when they do something well, they look for things which are closely related, which they could also move into as a niche in part of diversifying their economy. So they've actually begun to produce a lot of equipment, uh, which is separate from services, but uh, medical equipment, which they actually sell even in places like Italy. Um, and uh, yeah, so that's. It, 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 it's a wide category, but the very biggest earner, and of course the one which could be the thing which really helped their economy right now in this period uh, uh, is the actual providing of doctors to carry, um, to carry things out. Again, uh, on the blockade, I'm not gonna go into that very much, but Cuba's economy dropped 11% last year. And, um, a huge part, you know, I mean, everybody, whenever you say, oh, the blockade causes the economy to drop, people say, oh, you're just blaming that and you're not looking at the internal problems. And everybody in Cuba knows this is internal problems. But number one, the blockade has always been a huge factor along with internal problems. And the exacerbation of the uh, of the blockade under Trump is 
it is draconian. I mean, it was already draconian, and now it's, I don't know, draconian squared or something like that. Um, it, 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 it could be measurably, you could see in that 11% drop, I, I, I don't have the numbers, I haven't done it, it would be a big project, but I would just off the top of my head say 2 or 3% of that drop came out of the increase in Trump's, uh, in, in the severity of the, of the, um, of the uh, blockade under Trump, which of course we know our new liberal president is now said he has no intention of reversing. Uh, Al, could you, uh, you didn't, you, you mentioned remittances there. Yes. But is there any way of calculating exactly how important remittances are in terms of, you know, a fraction of the foreign earnings, if you want to say, or yeah. source of foreign currency that they are because yeah obviously it's very difficult yeah. to account for it all yeah so there are what i consider quite good estimates uh, of remittances uh carried out mostly by ex-cubans that live in miami so that's okay they, they do good they do they do they do good good jobs of of, of estimating remittances in my view um and the numbers do vary because, yeah, you know, a lot of it comes in, you know, sort of illegally. But they, 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 I think their methodology is about as good as you can get for the for the lack of data. And so what we saw was the sale of goods and services, the exports of goods and services, was you know, twelve billion, thirteen billion. Uh, Two thousand eighteen is fourteen point five billion. Remittances are somewhere between two and three billion. So they're big. Mm. They're very big. That's interesting. Uh, Marco, um, who's one of my students, uh, is a very good one. Has said, <laughs> I'm interested in your mention of decentralization. I was not aware of this process. Do you believe such continued devolution will bring any problems in the future? Well, uh, let me ask him, what sort of problems does he have in mind? Marco, are you there? You, he's answered your question with a question. <laughs> Maybe he's going to he's going to get a cup of tea. Okay, well, let, let me just answer it then, and then if if I do, don't answer what he asked, he can just re-ask it. Um, first of all, I am for decentralization in a major way. Uh, I. There's people that are into total grassroots, everything from the bottom. Uh, in, uh, no, that's a different paper. Um, I'm not for that. I think there's there's different levels that you have to have to interact in order to get total popular uh, representation in things. But um, uh, having said that, Cuba was phenomenally over centralized, as I said, more centralized than the Soviet Union. And so given that, the answer is yes, they should decentralize. What sort of problems could uh, come out of this? Well, they could have economic coordination problems. Yeah, they could. Hopefully they can design a way to coordinate. I mean, big companies that have lots of little enterprises have managed to do that. So they, they should be able to do that. And even if they did get a few problems in that way, they would lose some of their old problems, which was vastly too much red tape, vastly too slow to respond to stuff because it had to come out of the center and so forth and so on. So um, uh, I think the the gains are in general uh, connected to connected to decentralization. I find very interesting to me my thing. And, I'm actually hoping, you know, four or five years from now, maybe to go write a book on it, is local development. And so local development, you know, as opposed to, so decentralization, as I said, both takes place in shifting from the central governmental bodies to the regional governmental bodies to the local governmental bodies. That's one aspect. It also it occurs by shifting from the ministries to the productive units themselves. That's another center. They're all 
government, but they're, they're two different processes. But local development is a very interesting sort of thing with local governments actually setting up and running their own uh, local economies for things which are local, like bakeries and sweet shops and clothing stores and, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So it, there is a lot of there is a lot of discussion in Cuba about local development, and it actually is something which they can get a lot of aid on from, let's say, Europe, which, of course, is a fundamentally capitalist uh, thing, because, yeah, well, Europe has slightly different ideas of what local development are, but local development is also a, a big topic in capitalist countries. And so they actually have many uh, European sponsored programs uh, in uh, local development. And they've done some actually some fascinating uh, things in a number of pilot projects in, in local development over the last five years. Thank you. So the, the chat's clear. Um, any other questions from from anyone? Um, yeah, could I ask one, please? Yes, um, please. Yes, of course. Um, just wondering about um, this change in leadership that we're now um, there's no Castro's in power and <laughs> changes you think might um, develop as a result of that, please. Um, well, there's a couple of things going on. I mean, to say no Castro's in power is really just sort of a buzzword. I mean, it's obviously not the two people involved per se, but a buzzword for that whole body of people that rose to power with the revolution and, you know, have, have had the very top leadership positions, even though the middle leadership positions have been held by other people since the 1980s, but uh, since, uh, since that time. So, you know, what do I think that means? First of all, I'm, I'm, I'm basically for it. I mean, any system that, you know, relies on people for just too long, those people, no matter how good they are, they're, they're just not in touch with the way the younger people, and I don't mean just 15 year olds, I mean 30 year olds, think about things and do things and even see the world. God knows I can't understand young people anymore. So, um, so uh, yeah, so I think it's very, very good. Um, I personally, and I'm not going to say I uh, endorse uh, everything he does, uh, naturally, but I personally am impressed with Dias Canal uh, as a intelligent uh, leader, uh, trying to make changes, um, you know, and then the, the issue, and then I'll just stop with this, is just say the issue is always make changes. And, you know, people say, ah, oh, you know, when the Castros were there, when the old people were there, they're always against making changes. Well, actually, the Castros weren't against making changes. They were against making what they considered the wrong types of changes. And so they were trying to do it in a in a process that, you know, wouldn't wouldn't cause the whole system to go down the drain. Mm. Uh, and of course, they look very much because of their close relationships to Russia. And, you know, they actually I'm not entirely in agreement with this, but they view it's a widely held view in in, in Cuba that Gorbachev uh by bringing in changes the way he did allowed the system to collapse and whether you believe that gorbachev was trying to make radical changes to save the system or whether he was killing it very hard to tell because gorbachev would say one thing to one one group of people and another thing to another group of people all the time but it's certainly true that uh when yeltsin came in after gorbachev uh, that uh, everything was just thrown open uh, to change, uh, which basically meant you just fire sale everything in the country to the West. And that's, of course, what everyone thinks of Putin today, whether you like him, don't like him, whatever. 
Um, that's why he has been historically very, very popular uh, uh, in Russia, because, um, you know, he 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 ended that process. He said, yes, we're going to change. And he's in the process of changing uh, uh, Russia dramatically. Um, but we're going to do it, you know, uh, we're going to do it in a planned way. We're going to think out what we want and we're going to go ahead and pursue it. So I think, uh, you know, when when Raul came in and took power, one of the things I liked about, okay, one of the things I really liked about Raul, Fidel was this person that had this magnetic connection with the people in the, this electric connection with the population of Cuba in general. Uh, and, and, and he always had to be involved in everything personally. And that's overstated. I mean, he did delegate authority, but, you know, he, if he wanted to, he, he, he tended to, to jump into anything. And problems would come up and Fidel would rally the people of the country to address that problem and they would fix the problem. They would make the problem better. But then three years later, he'd be rallying them to something else and the institutions that were set up would tend to fall apart. You know, I don't want to make an overstatement. But that was, Raul was really an institution builder and the armed forces that were built under Raul were the most stable, best run institution in the entire country, in my personal, in my personal view. Um, uh, and Raul could actually go home, see his family in the evening, said, I mean, yeah, something came up, they called him by telephone, he wasn't out of touch, but um, he didn't have to be there uh, all the time. He set up a team that, that could run stuff up. And when he came in, he wanted to change the Cuban economy to something which had institutions that ran and not run uh, on the dynamism uh, of a particular uh, electric genius. And um, and I was actually pretty enthusiastic about that in 2006, 2007. And I, and I remain, I mean, I, I still have a lot of respect uh, for Raul, what he did and everything. But people in Cuba got a little tired. When he came in 2006, temporarily, 2008, got elected president, it's like, okay, you want two years, you want four years, you want six years, that's okay. But it's something over six years, you know, I, you, know you, you, you announce the monetary unification in 2011 and it doesn't happen until this year. You, you know, I mean, it seemed like, you know, trying to be careful to not screw things up, which is conceptually a good idea, can also be carried too far. Uh, and certainly a lot of people in Cuba began to feel, a lot of people that supported the system uh, began to feel that way. Anyway, uh, back to the sort of the question. Uh, I think I think it was time, uh, I think, to for Raul to go just because of his biology, um, besides the fact that he'd been in power for all that time. Uh, I think Dias Canal is a good choice. Uh, he's a much better choice than a lot of other people I was afraid might get chosen. So, yeah. I, I might add something as well. Uh, yeah, okay. please. Um, I think you've alluded to it quite well, which is this um, uh, way in which Cuba has proved itself to be, I think, arguably exceptional in the sense that there's they've managed a transition from a charismatic leader in Fidel, yeah. um, you know, without there being a severe rupture or rupture of some kind. Yep. Which which is this what's known as the Weberian trap of moving from a charismatic to an institutionalized yep. leadership. Yep. Um, and, and Cuba does appear uh, to have managed that because yep. Raul, as you say, was a different kind of Castro. I mean, right. he was one of the founding uh, and the second in command, if you like, right, with the same surname, yeah. but a very, very different character, right, and and was able to actually transition the country politically. I mean, you yeah. pointed out some economic problems, which I agree with. Yeah. It was it was glacially slow. I think yeah. he was frustrated himself in the in his capacity to actually move things along. But absolutely, but but he he did set the stage for. A transition to a younger, yep. different leadership, different yep. generation. Now, it's not something that Fidel hadn't tried. I mean, yep. 
The problem with Fidel's attempts were he brought up young leaders who finished up not meeting, being up to the job. Either yep. they weren't good enough or they weren't morally good enough. Yeah, you know, right. they, they had to be sacked because they were not 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 corrupt on Johnsonian standards, but yep. showing signs of being, let's say, less than less less than uh, moral in their right. in in their dealings with people. So that so yep. Fidel's attempts to find a successor always fell flat. Yeah. But Raul's managed to find Diaz Canel, and yep. you know he's fitted he's fitted the the job very well. Yeah. Um, and the other thing to look at, though, is the rejuvenation not of, of the top leadership, which has actually happened, because if you look at the Politburo of the Communist Party and you look at the uh, uh, the government as leadership, the, the, there has been a massive change there. Yeah. But, but uh, like you say, at the junior ministerial levels and so on, the government now is remarkably young. It's got an average age of 42.6, I think. <coughs> Yeah. And it's very diverse. It's one of the most diverse uh, leaderships in, in the world. It's got yeah. something now like about 46 percent women and getting on for 30 percent ethnic uh, BAME, if you want to call it, background people. And, and it's worth looking at things like Prensa Latina and some of the uh prominent women that are appearing as representatives of cuba that and black women as well which is really remarkable so there has been a significant transformation governmentally um over the last 10 years yeah yeah any any other questions Well, it's been really fascinating. I don't know if you want to um, um, uh, uh, have the last word, Al, before we before we go. Um, but that's it's been really great to have you, and uh, you know I've learned a tremendous amount, um, and I'm sure everybody else has. Yeah, I guess maybe just to uh, say something. You know, as I said, you know I've been studying the academically studying the economy of Cuba for. 35 years, and it's really fascinating. And I, I know a number of the people that are, you know, listening right now have been down to Cuba and interacted both with people in the street and people at different levels uh, of government and everything. Uh, and uh, they're an amazing people. Uh, they're an amazing people with an amazing set of ideas. Uh, Again, just sort of as a little bit of an aside without going on too long, one of my big problems was always uh, that their ideas were fantastic and they didn't always get put into practice quite as well as the ideas themselves. But, you know, uh, they, uh, uh, Cuba's an amazing place. Um, and and, and the, the point to end with, it just has to be underlined how extraordinary it is that Unlike Venezuela, it has continued to exist all these years in the face of just overwhelming aggression from the dominant power in the world system for 50 years. You know, uh, that's pretty amazing. Well, thanks, Al. So um, the, we, we've got a, another seminar next month. Um, Dr. George Lambie from uh, Hong Kong International University will be talking about basically the Chinese um, Belt and Road Initiative and how Cuba fits into that. So that's next month. I'll be uh, posting uh, information about that in in the chat and um, you'll be you should be able to you should be able to access the chat after the meeting. In fact, um, if, if you can't, don't worry, we will be sending out information. Do please uh, keep an eye on the website because that's updated we are on twitter as well and details of how to follow us on twitter is is also on the website um so thanks very much to everyone and thanks for the kind words in the chat from everyone yeah. i'm going to stop the recording and say goodbye yeah. thank you